Fancy intro music, yeah! Woo! So that way, if y'all got younger members, newer players, whatever, or future players, they'll have something they can pull from with the Discord and everything like that. We'll say uh, keep current chat to whatever you want. Just uh, don't go super crazy. If you do have a question, I'll get to questions after this. Throw that in the Rev Question channel. And uh, yeah, so we're going to cover 30 through 39 tonight. We will cover some random factoids, tidbits, crew loadouts, all that we can do afterwards. But more so focusing on best practices for 30 to 39. The reason I want to hit that is... More and more players I'm talking to are becoming burdened with the problem in this game, which is time. I mean, they're, they're simply putting in so much into this game where you feel like you've got to grind several hours. And in fact, you, it's not even a feeling. You do have to grind several hours if you want to compete at a, a respectable rate without swiping the old MasterCard, American Express, Black, whatever. So to do that, you have to start you know, preparing yourself into a certain mindset and start targeting things and planning for things very early on. You know, you can kind of fumble your way through the twenties and it really doesn't matter. You fumble your way into a Vidar loaded up all you want to. You could also build a Kira. Nobody cares. You blew a couple hundred uncommon. It's no big deal. But you know, uh, you, you look at, you hit 30 and everybody's goal is the enterprise, you know, cause it's the enterprise. I mean, every, every little, you know, sent virgin out there that loves Star Trek wants the Enterprise. Well, it's also going to cost you 51,000 uncommon gas. So you have to plan for that because even the the most beautiful of whales sitting in this room, how many of y'all are sitting on top of 51,000 uncommon gas just ready to go? I'm going to bet little to none of you, probably none of you. So the whole point of this is going to be work on planning so that whether you're 36, hopefully you'll pick up some tips here, even for some of the lower levels. If you're 30, you can work on going through the first one is one of my favorite controversial ones is to faction mine or not. And I have been more and more as I've worked with players and gotten in this game and gone deeper in the game on multiple accounts. I do not suggest you get a faction miner at level 30. In fact, I suggest you max out multiple horizons instead. And uh, the main two points that come up when it comes to faction miners is the warp range and the raid capacity. And I definitely understand the latter point because you want to get as many resources as you can to level up, and that, that's completely fair. The warp range point, uh, I'll tell you now, is really not that important. The horizon, once max, can go anywhere that you would put your faction miner. And then a lot of people will get into, well, level 38, I'm getting into deep space, and I'm going to go out and you know I need this miner. But you don't, because, and if you didn't know this, if you go to any hub system in deep space, so a hub is simply the that middle planet, and then there's spokes going off, your horizon can travel anywhere inside that hub. So if you relocate to that Thank planet, you, much, you can For then go to anywhere in that little area, whether you're trying to do, you know, a uh, mine or you're actually just hitting a rating. Uh, I think the last one we tested it, you could do something as small as an envoy and go between that hub. So the, the, the big thing that we're talking about saving on that is completely because of the theme I, I start off with planning for the future in the game. And it comes down to the cost of operating and creating these ships. So, you know, the, the obviously the cargo capacity of a faction miner is much larger than Horizon. A max Horizon is like 660,000. However, with Stan, you're pushing right at 1 million, which you're also only going to spend about 3,000 uncommon crystal to do that. And as every player, you know, in the mid to high 30s knows, Crystal is one of the biggest bottlenecks this game has ever introduced. And it is a real bottleneck that's basically intended. So the core, the cavort is going to cost 31,000 uncommon crystal to max. That's just the cavort. Fun fact, all the faction miners take crystal because logic. We got a crystal miner takes crystal. We got an ore miner takes crystal. We got a gas miner takes crystal. So going the faction miner out now means we have to pull crystal from other things. And crystal is going to be important for researches. It's going to be important for maxing out that salad in which everybody should be doing, including whales. Uh, it's going to pull a lot from those and then it also takes almost 7000 uncommon gas which right back at to our previous argument if your goal is the enterprise that's going to hurt even if your goal is not the enterprise cuz we've really reached an awesome point where D3 I'm sorry D4 Augur and Enterprise are all kind of equally good choices for different reasons which is great because a year ago that wasn't the case it was 100% enterprise but now you can kind of go different ways but even then 
If you're not getting an enterprise, say you're going the Klingon route, then the Burrell becomes a great option and the Burrell can kill good baby enterprises. You know, my Burrell was killing tier one through tier five enterprises and, and having a great time doing it. And that's only going to cost you about 20, what, 1000 uncommon gas, still a lot, but a whole lot less than an enterprise. So it comes down to you planning for the future. And can you truly take advantage of the bonuses that a faction miner gives you? Cause another point I bring up is, you know, I want to bring up is you, everybody talks about the faction miners having that bonus to mining, whether it be crystal or, or, and, and my response is always, do you actually watch those ships long enough to see that bonus? Cause to truly take advantage of a bonus from a faction miner, you'd actually have to set an alarm and calculate, okay, this faction miner is going to be done about 35 minutes sooner than my maxed horizon would. So I got to make sure I come exchange it out immediately to got by making the profit. This is worth me maxing this ship out because now I'm better than a horizon. Most people don't do that. If you're like me, you set a horizon out or you set a faction miner out. By the way, I have three faction miners. So this is, you know, painful experience of me spending, you know, uncommons on these ships. And you, you lay them out on these nodes. And a lot of times I lay them out overnight knowing they're going to get destroyed, but not caring because I'm coming home with so much cargo. And with the continued addition of more and more officers that protect cargo and increase that cargo cap, you know, you got to Pring, you've got the augment crew. Now you have one of 10. You can put all those on three different ships. You can put it all on one ship and, and, and sustain a, a sizable amount before you go OPC. From a planning from the future standpoint, it makes more sense to go there. And I like said this is all about planning for where you want to go because the 34 ships are the biggest, baddest ships in the game that you can reasonably afford, as in you can get there as a free-to-play player and as a small dolphin. A whale can do whatever a whale wants, so we're not really worried about the whales there. But if you're the average player, you're not getting a Katinga. You're not. I'm sorry. The highest free-to-play player in the game right now has been playing over two years. He's re going right to level 41, and he's got like a tier three jellyfish. So the whole like we're going to level up and, and get the stuff that the whales have, sure, if you play the game for several years. But I don't think most people see it like that. So let's move on to the, the next point. Um, and, and a lot of this is also built around... What can we do to ease the burden of the daily grind? Because that's extremely annoying. So to ease the burden of the daily grind, one of the things that we'll do is we need to start focusing on what specialty ships are the most important to do every single day or do during the week. So first off, the most important is the Borg, in my opinion. Doing Borg is the most beneficial to you for multiple reasons. One, the Borg ship itself, the Vidar, is at this point, in my opinion, the most valuable specialty ship in the game. That is it. I mean, I don't I don't see any of them being close. I think that the Discovery Summon feature is awesome. Still not the most important ship of the game. We all know the Franklin's a one-trick pony. And the Stella, while actually pretty decent at PvP in the upper 20s and even some of the low 30s, doesn't have the sustaining power. And it is probably the biggest grind of all the specialty ships. And then, of course, you got the Botany Bay, which we forget it exists. So Borg being number one, but also because of what the Borg brings you, and that's going to be faction credits. Remember, you need 180,000 of any faction credit to get a, you know, a three star epic, whether that be the Augur, the D4, the Enterprise. You got to get 180,000 of those. So getting that from your um, Borg grind is a huge benefit. And it, it, a lot of people wonder, well, is it really that much? Well, my tier seven Vidar, currently about to take mine to tier eight, my tier seven Vidar brings me. An extra 185 Federation credits a day if I do my, you know, Borg every day. And on top of that, with the event that I have for my Federation, on top of the daily that I have, I can be bringing in close to 400 credits a day. So from a mathematical standpoint, that 185 really does add up. And if you're tier nine, it's even higher than that. You're getting over 200 of those faction credits a day. It has also provides you the ability to change in for independent credits, which for those in the officer area, you know how much of a bottleneck that is. I think I need like 4,000 independent credits for my five of 10 upgrade. And the only way to get that is through the board panel and then going to the augment store which thankfully the augment store is very easy to do that one every day and then recycling those um 
decoded data tokens for the augment credits and using those augment credits to purchase independent credits. And that's a, a much easier grind now thanks to the node changes and what we'll talk about that in a second. Next one I would say is more important is territory captures, my number two important area that there is in the game. And it's going to be even more important in right around the corner a little bit after this video is going to come out because you have a brand new ship coming specifically for territory capture and with the research tree that just came out with territory capture I, in my opinion that research tree is the second best research tree in the game it immediately elevated itself to that level with its ease of access it doesn't have the roadblocks that the augment and rogue and outlaw tree has and a lot of the most important features are right up in the front so in the front you've got the officer conditioning which is very very good obviously but right after the second isogen you get to the efficient research efficient ship upgrades and efficient construction all of these efficiencies are up close very very cheap to start with and they all give an immediate bonus it's extremely important now they do require particles that you can only find in certain territories. And what I found on most servers right now is there's a lot of lower level alliances that have been smart and they played it out well. And I know several different servers who have captured the three territory areas. They've let the whales have all the big research bonuses. You know, for example, there's a three star area that does a massive reduction to ship repair. So if you're like a level 46 with a Newton, you really want that area because it's going to save you literally billions in repair costs. But the average player isn't really worried about having cheaper repair costs because even if they've got an enterprise, that's what? Five, six hundred K to repair, not that big a deal. I mean, yeah, it's a big deal, but it's not that big a deal compared to I think the repair cost before research on a tier five pillum is one point two billion. That's before your research is in your docks. So you're still spending several hundred million just to repair that thing when it goes down. So obviously whales are going to care about that more, but the low level player, that's what makes the territory research so important, is that is a tree designed for the average player. Scopely did something for the average player. Who would have guessed? Now, the whale lock in that tree is the fact that when you get into the 40s, some of those researches could start costing about 220 million dilithium. So a little bit pricey, but the main point is very valuable. My third most valuable then would be swarms. I still think the swarms are important because if for no other reason than the officer tokens you get between Khan and Mara, and then you're going to get those maxed out, start changing those in for transporter shards, and you get tritanium which is super important. Then Eclipse right now is the second least most important. I do like that they have Apex Outlaw out. That gives me a reason to do it. But if Apex Outlaw, the event is not active, I do not do my Eclipse. I just don't. There's not enough incentive for me because there's too much time in the day. So Eclipse is something I've cut out. I will do it when the event runs, and they've been running the event consistent enough for me to be leveling up my faction, getting my uh, Apex or my uh, Stella upgraded, then I can recycle it so I can then do the research there, but it's not something necessarily to focus on. And then finally, decoded data is the least important, but also the easiest. You can throw out a Botany Bay and mine the decoded data once a month, get a million decoded data, and you are peachy to turn in every single day for a long time. I am maxed out on my uh, augment rep and I'm trying to remember how much it is. I think it's what, like 73,000 decoded data is what I need from my max rep to get the 7,000 augment credits. And then I use 5,000 of those augment credits or something to get 55 independent credits. That's all I need to do every single day. Super easy, super simple. So then moves into the um, continuation of making things easier. One thing I recommend to all players, because I'm really worried about burnout. I have too many whale friends on different servers who are burned out from territory capture. I have too many different friends who've been playing two years burned out because now there's like 18,000 dailies. So what I really encourage everybody to do is to set yourself up a schedule. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you what I do for my two accounts. So Monday is my mining slash three-star mat mining day. I mine one day a week. And that's it. Now, I do it on Monday, so if everybody did it on Monday, that obviously wouldn't work. But I do it on Mondays just because that's the day that I do it. But anyway, I could do my mining for my Latinum with my Devor, and then I can put all my miners out on regular nodes, which are typically going to be pretty clear on Mondays anyway because everybody's worried about mining Latinum. And then I'm going to get as much as I need there and be done for the week. Now, I will tell you that I only pull from my refinery the 1750 pull every single time. That's the only one I do. And there's a reason to that. 
The reason being the 1750 pool gives you the best chance of getting uncommon. However, it's also going to give you the least uncommon possible. And what I mean by that is if you've ever played the roulette wheel, if you, uh, if 1750 is basically the, you're choosing red or black on the roulette wheel. So if you hit red, you win, but you don't win that much. The second option is uh, basically like if you if you choose a section on the wheel and like if it hits inside this range, we win. And then the third pull is you choose like 13 black. And if it hits 13 black, holy crap, we got 130 uncommon and five rare. But the odds of that happen are so scopely low. I hit 1750s and then what I can do and what this also helps me do, not only am I lowering my stress level by not mining all freaking day like an idiot. But second of all, it lets me continue to save things up because I can mine 100000 in a day like it's nothing. And that helps you have things stored away for when the bonus refinery comes around. And that's where you need to throw everything you got. And there was one time, and I wish it would happen again, there was a bug in the bonus refinery where there was unlimited refunds. And there was people who had 5,000 uh, you know, ores and stuff saved up, and they blew it all right then and got everything that they could possibly get. You pray for those days to happen again. I don't know if they will. But maybe we can, you know, we can believe in the Lord together that that's going to happen. But even with the horizon, you can mine tens of thousands of that on that single day. And then if you do in 750, you know, the 1750 pools, you're going to need less than 4,000 a day. So that means you only need what less than 20,000 a week. That's super, super easy. You know, so you're lowering your requirement level of what you got to do in the game. The next thing I do is Tuesday and Thursdays, both days I do my board grinding. So one fun tip, uh, you want to max out your Vidar, but my Vidar is tier seven. When you get your Vidar tier seven and that first weapon upgraded, there is a crew that you can use. We can talk about a little bit later. If you've seen my videos, you know what crew that is, that you can max out your cargo and go home with about half health and be happy as a clam. My cargo on my Vidar is currently sitting at, I think, 216,000. And I will go and grind twice. I will take my Vidar, grind it out, and then I will go home with 216,000 or 218,000, I'm sorry. And I'll do that twice. And if I do that those four times, I have enough to do all my pulls every single day between the getting the charge nano probes and getting the upgrades needed to upgrade the officers. And that's also very important because these Borg officers are quietly some of the best officers in the game. We just don't talk about them as much, but you, you want to get those active nano probes as well as getting the charged nano probes. And since I'm only choosing to do this two days a week, it doesn't feel like much of a burnout because it is going to take you, you know, 20, 30 minutes to complete filling up those cargo holds, go home, then come back and do it all over again. But if you're only doing that a couple of times a week, it doesn't feel like that much of a burnout. But if you don't aren't crewed right and you don't know what you're doing and you're just flying around hitting like 33 probes and bringing home 40,000 and you're spending 30 minutes doing it, you're driving yourself crazy. And that's the whole burnout thing. My goal with all this is, you know, teaching players how to operate in the 30s in the 30s so they actually want to keep playing this game they don't feel like it becomes a chore because there is a method that you can create for yourself that helps you continue to progress while also preventing the dreaded burnout and then uh, Wednesday tends to be a launch day for big events I'm not sure if y'all have ever noticed this pattern but there's a reason to it that they have seemed to found that, especially amongst whales, there's more activity on Wednesdays than basically any other day. So that's why you see so many big events coming in on Wednesdays. So what I do is, besides doing my dailies, I don't have anything special set out. So with this weekly schedule I'm talking about that I start at level 30, I'm, you obviously do your dailies. Go hit your hostiles, do research if you can, do your dailies. But on Wednesday, I leave that as an open day. So whatever Scopely throws at me, I'm ready. If they want to throw military supremacy and I qualify, bam, I'm going to do it. If they throw Apex Outlaw, bam, I'm going to do it. Whatever it is, Wednesday's a free day. Or you can just, you know, I don't know, hang out with your alliance, talk to people, actually enjoy the people you're playing the game with. Stop thinking you have to play and do something hardcore every single day. Thursday, I already told you what I did. Friday is my eclipse grinding and data mining if you have time. And I put that in parentheses. Like, if you have time. If your significant other would rather go out and, you know, get Mexican and y'all have margaritas, do that instead. It's better than Star Trek Fleet Command. Don't forget the outside world. But – Friday, use that as kind of a free day to do a little bit of that extra grinding on something like an eclipse or maybe do a little bit of an extra use as a swarm day. It's a day to just kind of do whatever. 
laissez-faire, enjoy it. Saturday, another free day. I really think too many people go seven days a week, four to five hours in this game, and that's why we don't hear from them after a year. Like they were the best players. Like, oh my God, do, do you remember, you know, Joe? He was amazing. Yeah, he just fell off the face of the earth. Yeah, because he got burned out because he treated this game like a job. It's not a job, everybody. It's a game. And then finally, Sunday, do your swarms, grind out your Franklin. Uh, the easiest way to max out a Franklin, FYI, is to hit OPC Franklins and you know, do that repeatedly, especially with the Vidar, with that 218,000 cargo space. Chef's kiss. Because when you need 2 million modulators per upgrade, the, the whole doing it every day thing doesn't work. So killing uh, OPC works really well. It's a handy tip. And that's what I do every week. And then the big here for 30 through 32, when you're choosing what ship you want to go at, you might want to consider skipping completely all the 32 ships. And I mean the Burrell, which I think is maybe one of the best models in the game. I love the Klingons. I have a legitimately real Klingon Batleth. How many of you nerds can say that you have a real Batleth? I do. I love the Klingons. But none of those ships give me enough of a boost that my 28s can't do before I get to my 34s. So you look at, say, the Gladius, which is probably... It's the second best. It's, it's the most well-rounded of the three. The Burrell's the best PvP ship. The Gladius is the best all-around, and the Intrepid is the best hostile grinder. But the Bordis, with Pipe and Rochin, can do almost as much as an Intrepid can and cost one-fifth of the price. You can park your Intrepid up in Wolf 3-9, and you can park a Bordis up there, and you're going to finish your dailies with both of them. And it's actually going to be cheaper for you to have done it with the Bordis because this repair cost is cheaper, and you're taking the maximization of using Pike Moreau Chin. So even though your Intrepid's kind of cool, I mean, I've got one that's like 2.5 million. Yeah, I've got one, and I wasted money and time on it because, hey, why not? It's a ship. It's cool. If you're out there and you're listening, don't don't waste. Don't, don't do like I did and just build stuff for the heck of building. I've got a Tier 8 Intrepid that literally never leaves the dock. It's just a h- ugly monstrosity that just sits there and looks pretty, I guess, whatever. So you you look at it from that angle, you might want to consider that. If you want to build them, that's fine. Just know what you're putting into and uh, know the levels. So you look at like a Saladin or a Bordas, you're looking at around 10, 11,000 uncommons to max that out. Then you go to the level 32s, you're looking at double that. You're looking at about 21,000 uncommons to max that out. You go to the epics, you're looking at double that, about 50,000 to max that out. So consider all of this when you're planning what ships I want to go after. Because unless, like I said, you've got 70,000 gas just laying around, or you want to give scope the equivalent of about, what, $7,000, start picking what you want, working on that, and making that a goal. I'd also want to give a real quick shout-out to um, Wolf39 and Altania. If you're looking for hubs to farm Federation or Romulans that you can relocate to that you don't know, Wolf 3, which is a 39 system, and Altania and ROM space are both hubs that give you 39s to attack with Pipe Moreau Chin. And with Pipe Moreau Chin, a Bordis will eat through those all day long and you'll be fine. Sadly, there is not a space to relocate like that in Klingon space, but there are plenty of systems to go to, you know, and, uh, and you can use that pretty uh, easily. No big deal. So let's move on to uh, the 33 through 35. And what comes first, the Enterprise Augur D4? Used to be the Enterprise was the given. The reason being is the Enterprise, how it works, was has a built-in officer. And that built-in officer is Spock. So if you ran it with Kirk, you essentially had four officers, making the Enterprise almost undefeatable. And a common cruise to run with the Enterprise, like in PvP, is a Gorkon, Khan, Kirk combination, emphasizing on criticals. Uh, the the one downfall of the Enterprise actually is it has terrible attack power. Like its DPR is actually really low. However, it makes up for this because it never loses its shield. And if you've ever wondered how the shields work, shields simply take the damage that's incoming and wipe away 80% of it. Wipe away 80%. 20% then goes and bypasses into the hull. So as long as the shields are up, you're essentially taking 20% of the damage that's not mitigated. Mitigation is a whole other discussion and argument. But, and by the way, Twitch, I see y'all know we're not replaying. I'm just trying to make sure I get through all this information as quickly as possible so that we can then get to the comment section. But I do see y'all talking and asking questions in, cheap, uh, in chat. So... 
anyway, back to how the Enterprise works. So now you're sitting at a place where it's a little bit different. Now, they never fixed Nero, which is annoying and stupid, but they did give you Giorgio and Ash Tyler, which essentially have given the auger everything it needed to now wipe that stupid grin off the Enterprise's face. Properly crewed out, an auger will smack the bejesus out of an Enterprise now, thanks to Giorgio. The reason being is how Nero procs. When Nero activates, Nero activates the first time during a round. So one of the rounds he supposedly activates includes that round. The problem with that is almost every officer ability that you'll find that relies on burning relies on that burning being there at the beginning of a round. So if it's not there at the beginning, it doesn't work. So what you end up happening is Nero is active for two rounds, but that first round is the round he turns on. But that doesn't happen at the beginning of the round. It happens in the middle. So essentially you take that away and now you only have things like DJ Aoki and Ash Tyler working on one round. George o works at the start. So that's what makes her OOP. And the reason that's important is you have the obliterator weapon. And now the obliterator weapon can actually fire almost every single time now and do that big cumulative uh, damage boost. Whereas before with Nero, it was firing and catching that obliterator like once every three times. So it's a huge change in DPR now where you can have an auger in a 20 round fight doing ridiculous damage versus an enterprise you know so you run something like um you know uh, several different loyalties you run but you could run george o, ash tyler and marcus for that shield piercing bonus to change some mitigation values or you could run five of ten as captain with george o on the side and and then run con to where now you've got george o activating the burn with a cumulative boost of the obliterator weapon now you got con turning every shot into a critical which is a now another what 185 percent boost thanks to crit damage and then you've got five of ten changing mitigation there's so many different things you can do now simply because they quote-unquote fixed burning. They just did it in a very annoying way, and that's stupid. I don't know why they did it that way, but they did it that way. And, and like I said, that's not the only way you can crew out at an auger versus an enterprise. That's just a couple of different ways. Another big one is going for Giorgio and then having the, if you have maxed, anti-faction officers, so in this case, Merrick Krell. So if you run a Max Merrick, a Max Krell with George O and the Obliterator turns on, you're doing millions of damage on that Obliterator shot. No exaggeration. It's ridiculously strong. It's stupid, awesome, and it's amazing. And I said all that to say, when you're deciding what ships to pick, you now have a legitimate option no matter which route you go. Some of this new stuff coming out makes the D4 even more I'll say the D4 has become the most versatile of the three it's not the best at anything it's not the best hostile grinder it's not the best at PvP but it's now become extremely versatile and a lot of this research is helping that the problem with the D4 is so many people tried to load the D4 the same way they would the Enterprise of the Augur meaning they were trying to take advantage of its ship ability the ship ability of the D4 sucks it's terrible and to give you a comparison of or a reasoning of why it's terrible, you know that the max D4 ability is, what, a 25% growth cumulative with hull breach active. DC is at 10%, and a 20-round fight will do more of a growth for you fighting an Enterprise than that hull breach ability will because it's so low compared to what everything else is doing. A 25% per you know, round is not that big because DC is every time he gets hit – if he gets hit three times, it's a 30% boost. It's 10% each time. So now that you have some of these new officers coming out, whether it's the speed crews or some of these critical crews, and you have more of an option to what you want to choose. So really, you're not wrong in going either of the ways. If you want to go auger, fantastic. Just be mindful that it is slow as crap. Like it is, it is lazy. It is very lazy. It is a millennial. It doesn't want to work. It doesn't want to get off its butt and go do its job. But it's awesome, like millennials and myself. D4, fast little go-getter, not great at everything, but crewed out will wipe Enterprises off the map too if the Enterprise doesn't know what it's doing and it has Spock on it. The Enterprise is still the Enterprise, still an amazing ship. I also want to point out that 33 through 34 becomes a very important area where I've told you to skip ships before. Now's the time for you to build a D3 and build two Mayflowers. You want to max out the D3, and once you get to the Enterprise, if you've chosen the Enterprise to a level you're happy with, you want to max out the Mayflower. The reason we're maxing out the D3 is you can get seven free primes by maxing out a D3. If that's not good enough reason for you, um, well, 
I, I don't know what else I could say. That's pretty daggum good reasoning, in my opinion. It's a bunch of four-star stuff you get with a max D3. And then the Mayflower you're going to want to do, you're scrapping the Mayflower to prepare you for that ISS jelly that you're going to want to have at level 39. But you're going to work towards that. Remember, everything we're talking about is planning ahead. The, the more that you're playing this game to get something done today – the more stressed you're going to feel. The more you actually plan, so like, hey, I'm going to do this so that it benefits me six months from now, the happier you're going to be. Because there's no worse feeling than getting a new ship. There's no worse feeling than getting a brand new ship and can only take it to like tier two and a half. Because it sucks, including the Enterprise. It's terrible. Ships aren't really good to like tier four, tier five. You get it to tier two, you might as well keep it docked. It's pointless unless you want to go kill Fendras. So you want to prepare so that you can actually get some good kills in and some fun logs instead of feeling like all you do is build another grind. Preparing for this is going to help you get there. And speaking of Scrapyard, one thing I encourage you to do if you're willing to add some grind to your life, a fun thing to do is to actually grind out in envoys and scrap them. You can scrap an envoy about every two and a half days. If you do three envoys a week, if you max them out, remember, it's really easy to go mine two star now with all the stuff that we have. And, you know, uh, to level them, all you got to do is throw them in augment space and let them get auto attacked overnight and everything like that. But if you do that, that's an extra 100 uncommon crystal a week. Who couldn't use an extra 100 uncommon crystal a week? I think it's 33 is what you get from the envoy. So you get 99. So 99 extra uncommon a week is fantastic for a ship that you're never going to use and for that you're collecting BPs to. And if you're wondering where you, can you get blueprints to this envoy, Separatist. Uh, the Separatist, like 17s and 22s, great place to just go and farm those things. You get relocation tokens. At least I've gotten really good luck with relocation tokens there. And you're going to get a ton of envoy blueprints that before you complained about not needing. Now, actually very useful for you getting some of those materials that you need to level up, get stronger, do better, be cooler, and uh, show off to your friends how awesome you are. You know, because who doesn't want to show off envoys? Question mark. Anyway, keep moving on the list because we're already going too long. Preparing for the jelly event. Now, remember the jelly event starts at level 36. However, I would recommend not trying to participate in the jelly event until level 38 at the minimum or the maximum, however that needs to be worded. Reason being is since they rose the bracket to now 40s and 41s can participate, you really want to get to a point where when you're going after that, you can spend not only G3 materials to score points, but you can spend G4 materials. And once you get to about 38, that starts becoming a realistic possibility with things like research, you know, at 39 where you can spend it on the jelly. All of these things start mattering. So you talk about scrapping that D3. You can also save some of those researches until that event. And then, bam, you just spent 4,000 rare uh, rare crystal on the prime officer's research. I'm assuming you may have even had all that one already. Who cares? Go spend uh, a 1,000 uncommon on the prime, what is it, the prime crystal one. Bam, it's a 1,000 you just spent. Points on the board. Planning, planning, planning is going to make your life so much easier. And if you've already gotten past these levels and you didn't do it, well, just tell your friends and sucks to be you because it sucks to be me because I didn't do this back in the day. This is learning from mistakes 101. But you get it at 36, but because they raised the bracket, I don't recommend going hard at that jellyfish until 39. Another thing I forgot to mention from the 30 to 32 area that I'll say now is if you're in that low level range, do rare and epic armadas. Do them, but save the credits. Don't spend rare and epic credits until level 38. Reason being is level 38 is actually the level that you get the opportunity to full pull a ISS jellyfish. Now, obviously, the odds are stupid low, but I've already had just in the past uh, probably two or three months, four people on my Discord pull full pull an ISS jelly. So it does happen. You also have the ability to get more epic directives to the rare packs, so those numbers go up. You also can get the uh, the rarers at level the my rare armada pack at level thirty eight gives me enterprises, augers, and d fours. That's all it gives me. Like down at level thirty, you're still getting hijacked ships. Who wants a hijacked ship? They're gorgeous and useless at the exact same time. I mean, it's you're the dog barking at the car going by. It's great, but you don't know what to do with it when you got it. So. I am big on save those credits. You get the Epic Armada pack because for me, I've been working on it for almost a year, but I have free to play grinded my ISS jellyfish. I am four shards away. I'm at 116 out of 120. 
And they've all come from Epic Armadas and from me placing in three different ISS Jelly events. So I've not spent a dime. I didn't spend money on Uncommon to get it. I didn't buy any blueprints. Not that that's an option. I didn't even go buy Epic Armadas. I just have been grinding through, going slowly through it. And now I'm almost there where I'm free to play ground my ISS. Now my luck is going to be when I hit 38 and when I'm two shards away, I'm going to full pull it's it. It's a lucky pull. Yeah, I'm going to full pull it. We've had two We've had two or three uh, so far on our server to get a full pull. Yeah, exactly. From and, when they were post-38. And another reason that I pointed out is because the full pull for the ISS Jelly seems like a higher RNG than the other ones. So when we were pulling, when Armadas first came out, I was, you know, in the low 30s. That's when Scopely gave me, and I'm not kidding you, you know, I think at this point I've gotten probably 80,000 rare directives from Scopely for free. But I've run through almost all of them. So you can imagine how many Armada boxes that is. And I did all those in the low 30s. Never once did I full pull a ship, and almost nobody ever full pulled a ship. It was unheard of. People didn't believe it actually happened. Now it's happening at this upper level far more frequently. So it is worth trying out. It's not a guarantee, but it's worth waiting to try out. Because just to be honest, I mean, you getting random stuff is not that important. The only exception is if you're at level 34 and you want to blow through those because you want to get you know, more faction credits. Because I do get great faction credit turnouts from my epics. I, I get great faction credit turnouts. So it, it just kind of all varies on where you're at, what you want, and what you're wanting to do. By the way, I see Zeke is not getting any audio, so if y'all want to help out uh, Zeke, I'm assuming everybody else is hearing fine, but I'm going to keep going. If not, man, that would suck. So now let's talk about the uh, ISS Jelly, and let's talk about some of this other stuff at 36 and 38. Um, I've said very, very much, often now, You're a gentleman and a very often now that I am not going to level 40 plus. I'm going to get my jellyfish and I'm going to sit at 39 and wait. The reason being is the cost of operation in the 40s for the average player. I'm not talking about whales. For the average player is not sustainable. You can't do it. And when I'm saying can't. And keep in mind, this is coming from a hardcore raider. I mean, I've got several billion rated under my belt. It's what I've done. It's what I've made my channel about and my name over. When you need, no exaggeration, three to four hundred million tritanium to repair a rare ship, you cannot raid that and reasonably play. And I was talking to a few different whales, and they basically broke it down to where they look at their packs and they go, I can play and repair for $5 or $10 based on this pack. The average player simply does not have that option. And you run to the the biggest issue with the ships that are closest, the ones that are most tempting are the Kelvin, the Katinga, and the Valdor. But they suck because they're all made of paper mache. So what happens is they all have good damage. The Valdor is the best of them, in my opinion. I think the Katinga would probably be second. The Kelvin does the most DPR, but the Kelvin's good for like one round, and then you blow on it, and it flies into the sun. So what you run into is, sure, you can get some good hits off, but if you notice, on almost basically every server, nobody uses Kelvins to go cracking bases or anything. Nobody uses Kelvins in PvP. They use them as like a bragging, look what I've got. They're the proverbial nutsack on the back of your pickup truck. It does nothing, means nothing. It just makes us hate you. It do, It's not actually good for anything. Everybody else just gets to see you and decide that they now hate you. That's what the Kelvin is. It's just the ability to brag about how cool you are. But in terms of usability... The whales in general as a group, and I've worked with whales that I've worked with. I mean, I think my server's got five level 50s at that point. I've worked with, you know, whales across easily 40 to 50 servers at this point. And they all basically have come to the conclusion, skip the uncommons and go straight to the Pillum or the Coronar. Some of them will go Newton just to change it up, but go straight on into the rares. Because the cost efficiency of playing with those ships is actually manageable in terms of you get more bang for your buck, even going against each other. So even a coroner fighting a pillum still is going to be cheaper to repair in terms of the damage you're producing than the uncommon ships. And when you think of it like that from a player, whether you're free to play or a small time spender, 
that is just unthinkable that you need to go from 39 to 46 to get your next ship to play with. The cost to get there is ridiculous. And there's some really good research in the early 40s that can really help you out. That's good. But is a few researches and bonuses worth it? Because also remember that when you hit level 40, your dailies change. Bam. They went my three star. Now I'm getting four star. Bam. My events changed. Now I'm not getting the rewards I was getting. So I can't go max out that enterprise I forgot to max out. Now the, now things are harder. Now, now the entire game has shifted to push me even higher levels to get the ships I can't afford to run. There's a method to the madness, people. There's a reason things are designed how they are. So unless you're willing to pull out the old checkbook and start writing checks for ships, don't do it. That's why I'm not doing it. There's no problem with doing it. I have no problems with Wells doing it. Thank you, Wells, for giving me a game to play because without you, Scopely wouldn't do anything. They would shut the game down. So we need to have it. But the biggest negatives of the 40s is if you are even a small dolphin or a free-to-play player, it's simply not livable up there. So that's something that you have to think about. Even if you're tri-faction locked and you're getting tons of faction credits and points and all these other things, you just don't get the resources enough. And the daily resources for, say, level 46, if you complete your dailies, they don't cover one-fifth the cost it costs to repair your ship. Not even close. So you're going to have to find a way to grind it out. And you can't really raid because let's talk about the miners in that area. So you're going to have uh, like the Bachor, the Klingon miner. So its cargo capacity is obviously larger than a faction ship, Thank you which is good. Much, sir. But tier five, its cargo base is two million. So you can add Stein on that, and you know we're getting a little bit bigger. You know that's that's not bad. But now let's talk about the cost of creating and upgrading this no, that ship. You're going to need tens of thousands. The repair cost, by the way, at tier five for the bot chore is 266 million titanium. Is 266 million titanium in repair worth a 2 million cargo hold? To me, it's not because I can have a cavort at 2 million maxed, over 2 million maxed, and be one, one one hundredth of that repair cost. Because even maxed, my cavort does not cost 2.6 million titanium to repair. Obviously, those numbers I'm throwing at you are before docks and researches. But once again, the bot shore is it's a looky. I mean, its max cargo capacity is if you take it all the way to tier 12, which I don't know if y'all want to know how much it costs, but I will tell you, tier 12 is a 4.5 million cargo capacity, which is freaking huge. But to get there, you're going to spend one trillion in tritanium, one trillion, 191,000 uncommon four-star crystal, 165,000 four-star rare crystal, and 45,000 four-star epic crystal. That's not counting the gas. To max that thing out to now have a 4.5 per haul run. And you would still need to hit a base 100 times of only tritanium to go repair your pillow. That's that's why I'm not going into the 40s. All that math. If you can afford to do it by buying packs, fantastic. But I'm not, and I can't, so I won't. But in terms of the 30s, through going from 30 to 39, there's a lot of planning you can do to have a lot of fun and to get a lot of good ships, like I said, the Augur, like I said, the Enterprise, and all that other stuff. And with the new updates that are coming out, like Territory Capture, there are things that they're working on as a dev team to make life easier, some quality of life improvements. But yeah, that's uh, 30 through 39, some best practices. I know that's in 40 minutes, we just covered basics. I didn't even go into really deep stuff, but now we'll get into some questions and then eventually we'll open up the, uh, by the way, there's a crap ton of people from the server sitting in voice. So shout out to y'all for coming in and participating, but we'll get into some questions. And the first thing I see is a freaking meme. better outro than the intro yeah